All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jessica Cecil. I'm the Education Coordinator at the National Aging Research Institute. Uh, welcome to our online seminars in aging program. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which each of us are meeting today um, and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Firstly, a little bit of housekeeping regarding Zoom. At the conclusion of the talk, we'll have some time for Q&A. If you have any questions, you could submit them throughout the seminar using the chat function, which can be opened using the chat tab at the bottom of your screen. So today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Kirsten Moore. Uh, Kirsten is a senior research fellow in the Melbourne Aging Research Collaboration at NARI. She returned to NARI in 2020 after six years working at the Marie Curie Palliative Care Research Department at UCL in London, where she focused on dementia and palliative care. So today she's going to be presenting pre-death grief and preparation for end of life in family carers of people living with dementia. Welcome Kirsten and over to you. Great, thanks Jess. Thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, predominantly my fellowship and I just want to start with acknowledgements, um, which gives a little bit of an outline of my, my presentation as well. So I'd like to acknowledge all the participants who have been involved in um, various aspects of the work I'm going to present today and also the funding I received through a senior fellowship from the Alzheimer's Society to do the Experiencing Loss and Planning Ahead study, which um, is an acronym LPAS, um, which was conducted at the Marie Curie Palliative Care Research Department, as just mentioned, and I'd like to acknowledge the research team and our advisors, and particular mention to Sophie Crawley, who was the research assistant who undertook quite a lot of the interviews for this study. And I'm just going to very briefly touch on another study that we've um, more recently started on, and which is an intervention for grief and loss in rare dementias. And that's um, coming under an auspice of a lar larger project um, run by Professor Sebastian Crutch at the UCL Rare Dementia Service, um, where I've been working very closely with Jill Walton, a nurse who's been working in that service for quite some time. So I just wanted to start with a bit of an introduction and background around grief and why I think it's important for family carers before death. So in the UK where this research was undertaken, the NICE quality standards um, sort of have a um, recommendations around bereavement care. And those, those recommendations were developed from cancer services. And in particular, these sort of percentages in this diagram is, came about from basically an audit of a cancer service that said, well, of the family carers in our service, how many people are accessing more formal supports after the death of their relative who died of cancer? So they came up with this sort of um, triangular approach or sort of three-layer approach where most people um, manage and process their grief without any formal supports at all. They use their social networks and their family and friends to, to cope with their grief. But the, that services recommend that they should at least get, everyone should get information about how to access grief support services if they, if they feel they need them. So that's over half people will, will sort of manage independently. Another group, around a third of um, bereaved people will require more, in, more sort of voluntary char charity services, befriending services, community groups, um, as a bit more of a formal sort of support to help them process their grief. And then a very small number might have what might be termed a prolonged or a more complex form of complicated grief, which might require more professional support, such as counselling, like mental health, psychological support. In a really useful paper was written by Linda and Harvath that looked at different types of grief before death. And they're really interested in this concept of pre-death grief in family carers with dementia. And what they distinguished was three different types of anticipatory grief. Because when I, often when I talk to people about my work, I say, oh, yes, anticipatory grief. But I think it's, this is a concept, again, that was established in the cancer literature where someone has still most um, usually is cognitively able to participate in, the, in a relationship before their, before their death and while they're dying with, with cancer. So there can be some therapeutic benefits to being able to deal with unresolved issues, have closure, have discussions with your family um, as, as sort of a way of preparing for end of life. And so it's, it's you know, it's described as anticipatory because it's what family carers are anticipating will they will experience once the person dies. 
Linda and Harpeth also acknowledged, uh, also recognised sort of a, a different type of pre-death grief being sort of more chronic so sorrow and related this more to sort of perhaps where children with having very severe disabilities where parents might feel um, that they didn't have the potential that they felt they might have had. So that's sort of more um, aligned with the chronic sorrow model. And then finally, the, their idea, the concept of pre-death grief was more specific to dementia care, where the cognitive um, decline may actually alter and significantly create losses while the person with dementia is, is still living. And they defined it as the emotional and physical response to the perceived losses in the value care recipient. The family experience a variety of emotions, such as sorrow, anger, yearning, and acceptance that can wax and wane over the course of the dementia from diagnosis to end of life. And research shows that, you know, quite a high proportion of, of carers experience this grief. So some of the losses that care, carers might experience while they're caring for a family member, um, a really significant loss is their past relationship. So they might feel that the person they used to be able to share problems with, look up to, um, reminisce, um, seek advice from, or, or become, might be impaired, particularly as the dementia becomes more severe. The person with the dementia no longer recognising the carer is a significant trigger of loss for a carer. And that switch in the roles, so often adult children talk about feeling like instead of looking up to their parent or, or going turning to their parent for support and advice, that that parent's now looking to them for support and advice. The person with moving with the person with dementia moving into residential aged care may also be a significant point of loss. And, and spouses often describe this as a paramount to the end of their marriage almost, that that's so significant that they've lived under the same roof and um, shared the same bed with, with their, their spouse for many, many decades. And when that finishes, they, they feel that that's a real, um, a, a significant emotional loss. And also the personal losses of, of some of the care of roles, so loss of income or employment, identity, social network tends to decline, having time to self. Etc. due to the care and role. And also what might complicate the grieving process in, for carers of people with dementia is that these losses are very gradual over many years. So there's not a distinct point in time that, that you know, you might adapt to one loss and then, then another loss occurs as the dementia slowly progresses. So there's a lot of uncertainty about how long the person with dementia will live and how severe the dementia will become. And so there is elements of anticipatory grief as well in terms of what will future care look like and, and how long will the person live. Um, there's also concerns about whether they'll be able to maintain care at home. Ambiguous loss is sort of the, the fluctuations in grief, like sometimes the, in the cognitive impairment that sometimes someone might be able to remember the person and other days they don't, so that's kind of, kind of having to currently um, adjust to that all the time. There's no distinct point to recognise a grieving process. And often people feel guilty if they if they do acknowledge grief when the person is still alive because it, it feels um, it feels wrong to do that. And then after death, there's a whole new set of fresh emotions: loss of caring role, processing guilt, and particularly if they have a poor experience of end of life care, if the person wasn't comfortable at end of life, this can also create additional um, difficulties in in the grief after death. And I just want to. Um, the work of Kenneth Doker in the 1980s introduced this concept of disenfranchised grief, and I think it's really relevant to carers here. And, and what he talked about was that when a loss or a relationship isn't recognised by others, that that can complicate the grieving process as well. So generally our society, our religion, our culture may sanction how and who experiences grief and how long we experience grief. So things like service, um, our workplaces might say that we can take time off work if we lose a direct relative, but may not have that um, built in for more distant friends, families, net, um, networks. Um, also, we sort of say that, you know, for, for direct relatives that it's acceptable to, to have a period of mourning, to do less, to, to disengage a little bit, to, to be supported by your social network more for a, for a sort of a culturally determined time. So we generally expect in our society that six to 12 months is a, is a time of bereavement um, and that if people aren't starting to come back into their routines or their daily life after that time, it might um, signify that they're more, um, they might need, that person might be needing a bit more support, perhaps professional support perhaps. And the funeral is an important 
part of this grief process where it's a pu public acknowledgement of grief and it helps the social network to come together and say, well, this people that are grieving need, need to get um, come together and support each other through this process. So when Ken Stoker talks about disenfranchised grief, it's much more that, that, that um, he talked much more about relationships that aren't recognised. So he talked about extramarital affairs um, and particularly at that time sort of more gay relationships where if your social network doesn't recognise that, that you're in that relationship, then they're not going to be able to support you if that person dies. And equally in, in family carers, if, if, if their social network doesn't recognise that they're going through a grieving process because there hasn't been a physical death, then they may not get that support either. Another concept which I was interested in my study is this idea of preparation for end of life, and it obviously has quite strong links with grief. Um, so there's been a, there's a sort of a small body of research around this concept and sort of how multifaceted it is around medical, psychosocial, spiritual and practical components. So it includes things like having the main person to make decisions, documented, knowing what to expect about a terminal condition and pr practical things like having finances in place or having a funeral process play, planned. Um, and an important part of this is having good communication with healthcare providers, particularly in relation to that medical knowledge and understanding the diagnosis, the prognosis, treatments, et cetera. But there's a lot of obstacles to discussing end of life and advanced care decisions. And generally talking about death and dying is fairly taboo in, in our society. So in particularly in um, dementia care, there's also issues around when to have these discussions. and how, how do we prepare people? There's actually no way of, I should, there, there has, when I did this study, there was no validated measures for preparation of end of life, but there is one that's in the pipeline and should be coming out available soon. It was developed in Canada. And the issue of care is not identifying dementia as a terminal condition means that they're not likely to generate discussion or to think about end of life or planning for end of life. So there's been evidence that links that preparation for end of life with complicated grief after death. So the more prepared you are, the less likely you are to have this more extreme complicated grief needing sort of more professional support. But there's been no relationship, no studies that have looked at this relationship in grief before death, which is sort of the focus of, of my study. We also know that being more prepared, um, that studies in the US have shown that white carers, carers with higher income and higher education, and those who have been involved in an advanced care planning process in a nursing home are also um, tend to have um, higher levels of preparation. So my study looked at the um, aim to examine carers' experience of grief or caring for someone with dementia and the strategies that they use to manage grief. And I also wanted to test the hypothesis that modifiable factors indicating preparation for end of life are associated with lower pre-death grief in family carers. So we did a cross-sectional study of carers, people with dementia at all stages, including people living at home or in a care home. We did face-to-face -face interviews with 150 family carers. I say, and friends, we did um, have that as an eligibility criteria, but I think we only had one person who identified as a friend, but we sort of sort of that are actually sort of in a relationship with the person. Um, so it was pretty much um, family carers. We did the Mawat Music Caregiver Grief Inventory, which has been used quite a lot as a pre-death grief measure in carers of people with dementia. Um, has a score range of 18 to 90, 90, with high scores indicating higher grief. We also used the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale and used a cutoff score of over eight. We also took copious interview notes at all of our interviews as um, a lot of the things that we were capturing weren't picked up in the the standardised measures. We did have a number, a number of other standardised measures too, but I won't go into too much detail on those. We also did qualitative interviews with 16 of these carers. So we did an additional interview after the, after the quantitative ones to sort of um, audio record and capture some of those comments and experiences in, in their carers' own words. Just um, briefly, the participant details, the mean age of 63, ranging from 28 to 86, most living either in major cities or cities and towns, or we did have 12% living in rural areas of England, 
um, around about a third were employed, most were white British, and their grief scores, um, it's, it's a little bit difficult to interpret the grief scores because there's no clinical cutoff that's been identified, but a score of over 71, which 15% had, indicates that they've reported that they um, are experiencing all 18 symptoms of grief on the measure and 62% scored 53 or over, which indicates that they somewhat agreed on average with all 18 items on the, on the measure. So I think both of those are fairly good indicators of, of some levels of grief. Um, there. For the person with dementia, the mean age was 80, ranging from 45 to 100. And we did have quite a high proportion um, of people with young onset dementia. And 27% lived in a care home. We were quite interested in not only measuring it using a validated measure, their experience of grief, but also their self-report of grief. Did carers identify as, as experiencing grief? Because we feel like going back to that disinterest franchise grief model that if carers don't recognise they're grieving, then, then, then it's going to be, it may create obstacles for their processing and understanding their, their grief. So as you can see, just there's a couple of things to take from this slide, is that 25% of our sample had um, mild, cared for someone with mild dementia, 43% moderate dementia and 32% severe dementia. And so across those different groups, you can see that um, just under half of, of people with mild Caring for someone with mild dementia would definitely felt that they were experiencing grief, but over 60% were either definitely or possibly experiencing grief. And so the recognition of grief did get slightly higher as you go to the more severe stages of dementia. And this is fairly consistent with other research that has shown that um, for people caring for someone with more severe dementia, that, 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 that grief intensity gets higher. But I think what's, what's interesting is that Despite the severity, there is still in the mild stages, the majority of people are identifying as having, as having some levels of grief. Um, and if we break this down by gender, we can see, again, we had a higher number of females in this study. Um, and you can see that they were more likely to report experiencing grief. So our males were much more, um, nearly, nearly half, or just, just under half, sort of reporting that they weren't or definitely weren't experiencing grief. And it was interesting that the not sure was um, it's only a small number, but um, we're all, all females. And to sort of just put that in context as sort of how their personal reflection of, or identification of grief related to their Mark Muser grief score. So that, that on the left hand, the sort of scores 18 to 88 indicate the possible score ranges or the whole score range of the Mark Muser grief score. So a higher score indicates the highest level of grief. So you can see that across the board, people are sort of in that middle band, um, but the people are definitely experiencing grief and those who are not sure seem, seem, seem to be um, reporting a little bit higher. So I guess that what's interesting there is that, that those who are possibly experiencing grief are reporting quite similar to those who are not or definitely not experiencing grief. Um, and I've had a lot of people say, suggest that perhaps males um, are less likely to recognise that they're grieving. And I, I think to a degree that there is some, some um, perhaps denial of that, but that there are also other evidence that suggested that the males were having lower levels of grief than females. We also um, this show this Venn diagram, which shows the percentages fitting in each category. So overall, if you look at the 35 that's outside the circles, 35% of our carers weren't showing um, significant levels of anxiety, depression or grief. Um, but I guess the main point of just sort of highlighting this is that we can see that while, you know, around a fifth of carers in that middle section are experiencing all three, so they're probably showing quite high levels of emotional distress, that a lot of programs focus on, on depression in, in care, care research. And so if we just focused on depression, we'd miss another third of carers who are experiencing either grief on its own, anxiety on its own, or a combination of those two factors. So... I think it's just to sort of raise awareness that, that um, just focusing on depression may be missing um, an important aspect of caring. To present just briefly, if you want to, um, I'll show the reference for the paper if, if you want to read more about the results, but the regression. So in this table, I've shown all the factors that we included in our model that looked at predictors of grief, 
And on the left-hand side were the hypothesised factors of, of things that we thought would reflect preparation for end of life. The bolded ones were the only ones that came out as significant. So there wasn't really much support for, our, for the hypothesis, except that social support in health seemed to be protective of grief or have be associated with lower levels of grief. The asterisk shows where the significance was shown for one of the subscales of grief measure and the dementia knowledge, interestingly, was, was associated with um, heartfelt sadness and longing, which I think is one of the more important subscales of the measure. But we didn't find any relationship with good relationship with healthcare providers, formalised documents about end of life and end of life discussions with a person with dementia. And um, I think one of the reasons for that is perhaps that we had a fairly binary measure of yes or no, those things have happened, but we didn't really capture the quality of, of that, particularly for the formalised documents and end of life discussions with a person with dementia. Um, for the non-modifiable factors, we had significant relationships with care agenda. As I mentioned, the female, um, female participants reported higher levels of grief than, than males. The change in relationship closeness, so the more that you felt that the relationship closeness had reduced since the diagnosis of dementia, the higher the grief intensity. Um, and the relationship type, this was showing that if you're a spouse or an adult care, adult child compared to other relationships, that, that those two groups had higher grief than other relationships. And I'll, go, I'll look at that data in a, in a moment. The age of the person with dementia was only significant um, for one of the subscales. Um, and I think that was more relating to sort of more of the burden aspects of the, of the measure, which is one of the limitations of the measure, I, I feel. So we didn't find any relationship with where the person with dementia lives in terms of rurality, um, dementia severity, religiosity, or deprivation. So there's quite a lot to take in on this slide, so I'll just I'll break it down. But what I was looking at is sort of relationship and gender. So if we looked first at the um, just the relationship type, we can see the spouses had a, a mean Mowat uh, grief score of 59, whereas adult child carers had a score of 57, and other carers had a much lower score of 44. So that was one of the significant differences, was that very small group of other carers showing much lower levels of grief, which is, is kind of what we'd expect. Um, I think what was, what was interesting, though, is if we break it down by gender, if we look at the spouses, if we look at female carers caring for their male spouse, they scored 62, which was considerably higher than male spouses caring for their wives. Um, and also if we go to look at adult children as carers, the, um, those who were caring for, the women who were caring for a father had lower, Sorry, I'm getting wrong now. The males who were caring for their mother scored much lower than the female carers. And interestingly, female carers reported higher levels of grief caring for their fathers than for their, for their mothers. So, um, yeah, some interesting findings. We also asked carers to describe their avenues for, for grief support and we did provide some sort of categories for this, but we did have quite a few that sort of described other things that we sort of hadn't thought of initially. So that other things included care and forums, care education sessions, Admiral nurses, which in the UK are specialist dementia nurses who provide a lot of support to family carers. So overall, 55% of all participants have sought professional support either through a GP or counselling because of their concerns about grief. And we found that even those who weren't grieving also reported high levels of sort of seeking support for their grief. Um, family and friends, as per most bereavement models, were the main sources of support for people um, to deal with their grief. But we did also see that high levels of access to care support groups and the counselling, as I mentioned before, and also information. Um, we did have some carers say that they previously accessed support such as counselling, but through the counselling um, felt that they were now managing their grief and so no longer felt they were caring, so they were no longer grieving. So that might explain why some um, it sort of reported accessing those things um, but were no longer grieving. We found sort of three themes in the way carers uh, manage their grief. 
And one was around sort of embracing their carer identity, one was psychological strategies, and, and one was seeking support. So just in a little bit more detail, embracing the carer identity was where um, carers either found fulfillment or um, felt the caring role as being rewarding and, and got enjoyment out of that. Um, but some describe it as being sort of embracing that, well, I am a carer and therefore I need support. And so putting their own needs first or, or, or really um, focusing on their own needs as well as, as a person with dementia. So getting respite and, do it and, and taking part in activities, doing exercise, looking after yourself. Um, and the reciprocating care was also really important. So a lot of people, obviously, they were participants in research, so they felt that giving back through research would help other carers and, and, and that was a way for them to cope with their grief and their loss by, by thinking that, that participating in research or volunteering would, would help other carers and make it perhaps easier for other carers to deal with these, these losses. The psychological strategies were definitely lots of people saying, I just need to be positive, I need to, you know, use humour, accept the situation. Um, and, and also practical issues were sort of like, if I can cope with the practical things, then I can sort of think about, I can kind of deal with the emotional side of things as well. And people also talked about separate, separation. Um, so either separating from the person with dementia or separating the person with dementia from the dementia. So I think particularly in the earlier stages of dementia, people would talk about, you know, reminding themselves that this, so to say, if it's a behaviour that's annoying them, sort of having to remind themselves, well, that's not the person that I love, that's the, that's the dementia that's causing that, and, and I need to sort of make sure I can separate those two things and, and focus it still on, on, on sort of the, my relationship with the person with dementia. I think as the dementia progressed, that possibly became the more of the theme of, of actually separating from the person with dementia so um, I think sort of a fairly stark um, picture of that was um, a husband whose wife was a very severe dementia in a nursing home and he started a new relationship with another woman, which he didn't consider as, as, as cheating on his wife because he felt that essentially his wife was no longer there and, and, and um, sort of his marriage contract was over because of her, the stage of her dementia. So it's the final one, seeking support, as, as I've talked about, seeking support from friends, family, peers, professional support, and getting practical assistance helps to deal with the emotions. And just some quotes there. So if so many practical things, I have so many practical things to do, and I feel the need for so much practical help. So those, those things could be eased for me at home. There wouldn't be the emotional fallout from it, or not so much anyway. And accepting we can't do anything about it, so just manage the situation, just laugh about it, really. And lots of people had comments like that. This one is a comment about sort of the sessions with psychologists being able to talk to someone who isn't close family or friends. So the psychologist, she can tell everything is normal, that there isn't one thing that she has said that psychologists hasn't heard from other carers. So it's just sort of normalising it for them. But we also came across lots and lots of obstacles of emotional support and processing grief. There's denial, avoidance, self-blame, lack of time to seek support, a sense of futility that nothing will help, talking to others won't help, um, that others can't understand what I'm going through. The carer doesn't want to burden their social network or their formal services, that they've had difficult relationships with a person with dementia or other family members, either in the past or, or now, and so that sort of really impacted on their ability to sort of get support from those people. And there were lots of service system barriers. So there were waiting times, services being cut, carers talk about support groups and carer groups that were that ceased to run after um, due to funding cuts, that there was fragmented services, not um, in the UK, if, if they were there is a um, the Carers Act implies that everyone who's a carer is eligible to be assessed, um, but in reality, if the carer could self-fund the services, then often they weren't even assessed for their needs. The cost of services was a barrier and the lack of continuity and relationship building um, across services. So an example of that was someone who was using a junior sort of introduction, a, a, a counsellor who was sort of in the fairly early stages, and so they could get access that fairly cheaply. But once that person qualified, then the cost of that service went up and they could no longer continue. And so then they'd have to establish a new relationship with someone else. 
Um, this is a, a spouse in care of someone with mild, his wife with mild dementia, sort of saying, I don't honestly think there's any real upside to extremes of knowing there's something that will get worse over an extended period and something happening suddenly. So he's comparing this to his first wife who died quite suddenly. So I think in sense I'm facing the two extremes and this one is harder, obviously. I think I also suffer from having a reasonably vivid imagination so I can visualise stages, you know. I genuinely feel at the moment from my wife's standpoint it's a much bigger problem for me than it is for her. And in relation to care support groups, it left me so depressed hearing other stories, was going home a wreck, I think it might be useful for people who need to offload but that's not my personality. I'm just overwhelmed by this feeling of gloss and grief and sadness. I've got no one to talk to about. I don't want to depress my friends because, again, my closest friends have had some traumatic things in their lives, so I didn't want to overburden them with my problems as well. I need someone to talk to. That's all I wanted, someone to talk to. So just um, obviously these interviews covered quite a lot of um, fairly emotional topics, so just to sort of highlight that we did ask carers whether they found the interview distressing or helpful. And we, if, if we sort of look at that, um, the no category on the left hand side, that that's the people that didn't find any distress, sorry, didn't, didn't find the interview helpful. So most people were found the interview very helpful and um, very few had a little bit of distress. So we were sort of help, we sort of thought that the sort of weapon weighing the risk versus benefit that overall there was no participants who found the interview unhelpful and distressing. So just to sort of highlight that, um, that these interviews can be helpful for people to talk about too. Um, if we have time to talk about, I'll just briefly talk about, we also surveyed memory clinics, Apple nurses and care homes about how they prepare carers for end of life and whether they screen for, um, for pre-death grief. And we, we focused on accredited memory services where we got a 51% response rate, admiral nurses a 59% response rate, and care homes, and we did a random sample of care homes that have gold standards accreditation in end of life care training. So um, but we got a very low response rate um, from care homes with 44 or 38%. So just to um, highlight some of the key findings, well, um, memory clinics are the green bars, so they um, routinely discuss with family carers that um, dementia is a progressive condition. But when we move to the sort of second group of, of responses around dementia as a terminal illness, we can see that that drops from 90% down to about 40%. Um, spirituality and meaning of death is, is something the memory clinics felt was definitely not part of their role, but quite a few of the care homes um, did do that have discussions around that. Um, the importance of the social support for carers from their social network was quite high amongst Aboriginal nurses and memory clinics. Um, the implications of loss of capacity were quite high, but um, actually only 60% for memory clinics, which you, you'd expect might be, might be a little bit higher. Advanced care planning discussions was fairly um, commonly reported as happening, uh, as well as the legal health and medical arrangements. We also asked whether they had any process for screening um, any of these following um, aspects in carers. And as you can see, the memory clinics and admiral nurses fairly routinely screen for burden, depression and anxiety, um, but pre-death grief was much um, was not recognised as often for, for any of the services. Um, the admiral nurses were most likely to, to, to focus on pre-death grief and, as we would imagine, the care homes were most likely not to be screening, screening carers at all. We also... So my fellowship overall, I probably should say that up front, but it did involve sort of three aspects. So the first was the interviews with carers, the second was the survey of service providers, and then the third was to develop some sort of resource relating to pre-death grief. So we pulled together the information from those first two, um, first um, the, from the surveys and the interviews, and we did a co-design workshop with carers, healthcare professionals and a representative from Alzheimer's Society and sat there and said, well, we've got all this information. What's, what, what would be the most useful thing for us to develop? We have a fairly short time scale and, and small budget for this. So we 
decided to develop an animation to raise awareness and to allow carers to breathe while they're caring for someone with dementia. So we had to actually go back and re-consent participants to, to actually use their voices in the animation. And so we, um, we sent them the words that we were hoping to use from their interview in, in, the, in the animation. Um, so the aim of the animation was to signpost to other services if people were struggling with the grief and also help people recognise that, um, that it was okay to grieve. We had it evaluated with 31 carers who had taken part in the initial LPAS interviews um, through an online survey. We, we did this just before COVID started, so we didn't quite get the sample we were, we were looking for as we had to stop data collection in March last year. We found that the carers who reported the animation to be very relevant to them. Um, and also some found it to have, uh, to be a little bit distressing and 4%, I think that ends up being one participant found it caused a lot of distress, which is quite um, not great. Um, we also asked whether they felt that the animation would be useful for them, for other carers, for their own family and friends and for healthcare professionals. So as you can see, um, Sorry, that, those blues are a bit confusing, but the, the, the very useful um, is sort of around 25% of carers thought it would be very useful for themselves, but they were more likely to say it would be useful for other carers um, and also for healthcare professionals. Um, some reported that the timing of it wasn't right for them because they were in now quite an advanced stage of dementia and that might have been help, help, more helpful at an earlier stage of dementia. So some of the comments we got was that you've covered many aspects of the isolation and sadness we all feel, but also some of the less known emotions like grief. It's a new way of thinking about grief and it's not, it's useful for us to have a name for what we feel day after day. It really is a kind of grief, but the word always seemed to me too strong for what I felt. And now I feel I can own it in a way and acknowledge that there are ways of feeling grief, even if there isn't a death. And I think this really touched on what, what we were trying to, to achieve with this. Um, other comments were sort of feel this animation would have been useful in the early stages following diagnosis to support families who are trying to make sense of the changes in their loved one. And listening to how others feel makes you feel not on your own. So moving on to the last thing that I want to touch on was the program that we're currently working on. So we've developed a program with um, family carers of people at the Rare Dementia Service. So most of these carers, um, they're located across the UK. They can access this service um, anywhere in the UK. So many of them, or, so once we went into to lockdown, this sort of became an online program that we decided to develop. Um, but also because of Rare Dementias, the, it's very difficult to, to bring care and support groups together because, um, because of the Rare nature of their conditions that they're geographically quite spread out across the country so it kind of worked out well that, that sort of we were thinking about whether this would be better as an online program anyway so we developed it um, last year we developed online we, we used all the findings from from my fellowship but also the existing literature on pre-death grief and we developed a six session program that will be run over three months um, in one to half to two hour sessions facilitated by Jill, who's an um, experienced nurse in, in dementia care. Um, obviously, with rare dementias, a lot of the carers um, or a lot of the people with dementia have, get sort of a young onset dementia, so get diagnosed before the age of 65. And we cover topics of sort of acknowledging grief and loss, thinking about identity, care for end of life, asking for help. And we also have a focus on sort of creative activities, so doing things like photography, expressive writing and mindfulness. Um, we've developed a manual, which I've got an image of there, which each participant will see and gives them space to sort of, it gives all the information that's covered in the sessions, but also space for them to explore and to record their own experiences and, 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 and feelings. So we only just started this pilot in um, just last week um, with an initial rollout of, um, with 10 carers. And we're doing evaluation, looking at pre-post measures of grief, resilience, quality of life, depression, anxiety, guilt, burden, preparation for end of life, and social support, um, as well as some qualitative interviews. And so we hope that um, that we can look at this and 
obviously if we um i'm interested in whether we can do further work and, and trialing it or using it developing it modifying it in australia so key points from from our from this work is that you know that we know that grief before death is quite common in family carers of people with dementia that we didn't find a strong relationship with preparation for end of life and, and grief, but perhaps we need to look at this more in whether the conversations are emotionally comforting or distressing, you know, what, what is the influence of those? So more sort of qualitative, we look at how people are having these conversations and, and how useful those conversations are. That, um, that carers combine a range of different ways of accessing both formal and informal support and psychological strategies, um, and also try to embrace the care and role to manage their grief, but they face a lot of obstacles in accessing the types of supports they need. We found that more than half of carers will seek professional support for grief and loss. And that this doesn't really resonate with the bereavement guidelines that, are, that suggest that around 10 to 15 people will require that more formal professional support. We also found that women were more likely to experience high levels of grief than men. Um, the animation may be useful in raising awareness and acknowledging grief, um, but has been developed in the UK context. So it does refer to um, contacts and, and services in the UK. Um, and we hope that the new grief program will, will provide um, a new intervention with scope for further testing and implementation. So I've just got um, publications that um, people can look up if they're interested in reading more. We've got a number of um, a number that are under review at the moment or in preparation. And there's a link for accessing, accessing the animation. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, you yes. can move to a Q&A portion. Great, fantastic, thanks. Um, now we have some time for Q&A. If you have any questions, uh, please submit them now through the chat function. Uh, alternatively, if you'd like to ask your question in person, you can turn on your camera and microphone um, and we'll call on you in turn. Uh, so our first question is um, from Shivani, who says, hi Kirsten, out of interest, what constituted social support in health? So we use the um, health literacy questionnaire, which is actually an Australian measure um, by Graham Hawthorne, I think. Um, it's, it's the health literacy questionnaire actually has nine subscales and one of those subscales is social support in health. So it's mainly, it's a small number of questions that asks whether or not you've got someone that can go to a doctor's appointment with you, someone you can talk to and someone um, that can sort of support you if you are unwell and things like that. So it is, it is related to, to health. And actually, my, um, the research assistant, Sophie Crawley, who um, was the research assistant, did a lot of the interviews for this study, is now doing, I'm now supervising her PhD, and she's looking at this um, much, in much more depth. So she's, she's um, looking at lot, a lot more broader range of social support measures and how they relate, and quite interest, interested in looking at sort of the negative social support. Um, aspects as well sometimes the you know the conflict in family and how that might inf influence as well so Great. keep your eye out for the future uh, Joan you'd like to ask a question um thanks Kirsten it's fabulous work and really important work um, <laughs> thanks Joan so you, your findings on gender were interesting in particular I thought and I wondered if you had some uh, thoughts about why those differences exist and I guess what went through my mind was the socially desirable response and whether men are less likely. Is, is there any research about differences that you can draw on from um, other areas? I, 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 don't, I don't know that there's... Um, I haven't come across any literature that sort of talks about actual socially desirable reporting in relation to grief. I, I genuinely think, you know... I, I, I could I could give, give sort of a two two um two responses as fairly salient examples I guess that stick out in my mind, and one was a, a carer spouse who was a, a male caring for his wife, 
who genuinely was not grieving. He was, um, he'd sort of had this period of enlightenment from, from being a carer. So he became a priest because of his role of becoming a carer. And he talked about how he suddenly realised how much his wife had done for him all these years. And now that he was doing that for her, he, he felt like he was being able to sort of um, give back to her what she'd given to him over the years. And and, the, and while he he had some level of sadness about the disease, he actually was quite um, very positive and, and um, felt it was a really important part of his life and, and was quite enjoying it in a way. So... I genuinely felt like he he was not you know his his report of not grieving was quite genuine. Um, and then another another case that another husband that that stands out in my mind was was def, who who said that he definitely wasn't grieving when we when we went through the, all the items on the grief measure. Um, he, he showed all the signs of, of loss of relationship, terribly distressed that of what his wife was going through, really missing her, really isolated. Um, showed all the signs of, of grief. And, and the way he framed it was that he was definitely not grieving because grief was a useless emotion. So um, so it was it was not that he didn't recognise that he was grieving. He was just, he sort of just refused to acknowledge that grief, that he was going through a grieving process because he didn't feel like grief was a useful thing to do, which was quite an interesting um, perspective. But um, I'd... Yeah, I mean, and there were there were male carers, you know, that, that one of the quotes I put up of, of the man in caring for his wife in the younger stage who were really very openly acknowledging that they were really grieving. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I guess it was a smaller number of, of men, and but some, some were quite positive about it. Um, there was another one who was quite religious, who felt that... Um, if he prayed enough, that, that the dementia might be cured. So he was quite um, possibly unrealistic about about what what the future would bring. Um, yeah, so there's lots of lots of different things coming out. I think. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Kirsten and Joan. Uh, the next question uh, from Natalie, or a couple of questions from Natalie, uh, is: Would there be a potential for the animation to be used or shown in Australia? Yeah, well, I've got the link there. So anyone's, um, it's free to use. It's on YouTube um, or you can access it through the UCL website, which has links to the other support services. But as, as I mentioned, it, it, it doesn't, if, if I, it would be good to be able to modify it or develop something more with a more Australian flavour. So we're using the voices of carers in the UK. So I think um, there's definitely potential to develop something similar here. Um, but I think... I think the messages in it are the same, but it's just that more the sort of um, if you were using it with carers, it's it's about giving them access to where would they go for, for future support if they were in Australia. And I think that's the kind of gap. Great. And Natalie also asks, I noticed that you interviewed people with younger onset dementia. Did you find that their grief thoughts and comments were different to those over the age of 65 years of age? Yeah. Um, I, I, we, we didn't we didn't find that the age was a, a hugely significant part in the regression analysis, um, but there definitely was you know I mean across across the board there were people experiencing really intense levels of, of grief and distress and um, I guess that was definitely the case in in some of the younger onset um, cases whether it was different it's there was nothing that sort of screened out that, that the experience was, was different. It was just that it was earlier in life, I guess the life stage aspect of, of anticipating that you're going to spend that time, retirement and future years with a person um, is quite different. So it's it's difficult to, to say that. Um, but the program we're, we're doing at the moment, um, we've adapted the findings from this to, to be relevant and as I said we're working with um, Jill who's been working in the regimental service for 20 years so she's quite um, experienced working with people with young onset dementia and and focusing on sort of specific issues relating to sort of having young children at home trying to maintain finances and, and income and jobs and things like that 
Um, but some of those issues were still relevant for people caring for someone with older men, um, not with young onset dementia, that were also juggling those sort of issues as well. Oh, that's good. That's not a very, not a very clear answer. <laughs> yeah. I think some of the other, I guess one of the other issues that came up was the, the genetic aspect of it as well, that, that you might um, be dealing with. You've, you've had one sibling die of dementia and now you've got another sibling with dementia and then you're thinking, am I going to get this myself as well? So, um, yeah, that's, I guess that that's a bit more unique in the rare, dement yeah, rare young ones of dementia is that sort of genetic aspect of it. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll move to our next question. So Jesse asks, hi Kirsten, do you have any thoughts on how to improve end of life discussions in healthcare services? Yeah, I think I think this is a really, really big area and I, I, um, I don't think we really have the answers yet. The, 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 the biggest issue seems to be sort of who and where and when. And I think at the moment, there isn't really any sort of one who, sort of has kind of responsibility for having those conversations. So they don't tend to happen. Um, and the context where they do tend to happen is in a fairly, um, in, during hospitalisation at a fairly possibly advanced stages and decisions have to be made fairly quickly. So ideally we'd be having those dis discussions in a less sort of urgent, acute sort of um, context um, and providing better education to family carers about how dementia progresses. And I think this is this is probably the gap. I think something we need to do more sort of in the first 12 months after diagnosis perhaps, um, but it's very difficult because the timing is, is really difficult to get right. Um, people aren't ready or don't want to know about the advanced stages always early on. Um, the idea of being able to involve the person with dementia in discussions early on, it, it seems to be problematic. Um, we've actually just done a qualitative study with people with early, um, with mild dementia around nutrition and eating for and, and what they would consider okay in terms of whether types of eating, you know, because often in some cultures there's still use of tube feeding or artificial nutrition hydration. Um, so, but even at those early stages, they really couldn't record couldn't um, comprehend that, that they would ever get to that stage themselves. So to make decisions or have those discussions about thinking about the stage when you've got a cognitive impairment of, of how much things might be in the future when you've got a greater cognitive impairment and more functional limitations is very difficult to, to conceive. So the timing of these conversations is, is still quite difficult as to when is the best time. Um, I think I think we should at least be talking about dementia as being in a terminal sense, because still a lot of carers, um, a lot of carers said to me, is it terminal? And, and or can you die from it? And, and they say, I've asked my doctor and they won't, I, I don't get a straight answer. So I think we need to be just clear that, you know, it's now becoming one of the highest causes of death um, in Australia. It so probably will be in the next um, few years. Um, so I think we just need to be open about acknowledging it as a terminal condition that does have. A progression and does have lots of similarities um, even across different dementias if you get to the advanced stages um, which most people do then those advanced stages tend to become more similar across um, across different diagnoses of dementia different dementia types great so improved communication um, <laughs> yeah you mentioned also several obstacles to processing grief in particular listed quite a lot of um, service system barriers do you have any recommendations for how those barriers could be overcome? Well, I think I think there's always there's a lot of evidence or a lot of a lot of support for the idea of just having a key contact or a key service that that stays with you throughout the journey of, of dementia. Um, and I guess there's lots of obstacles to this happening with fragmented services and, and different services coming in at different stages. Um, and also, I suppose if you've got your one contact is one someone that you don't particularly trust or rely on or, or have a good rapport with, and that that might be a great thing either. But I think there is a lot of support for this. This I think it's about relationship building, and to have a conversation about end of life, you need to have established and have conversations with someone over a period of time, rather than just um, think that you can send someone in and have a discussion as a one-off thing. So 
I think um, somehow in our system, we need to have a, an ongoing contact who knows about dementia and, and can support dementia. You know, we have, um, we have diabetes nurses who, who sort of stay, who you go and visit on a regular basis each year and, and, and get information and check up about your diabetes. You know, when are we going to do this with dementia? Great. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, so everybody, uh, please join me in thanking Kirsten with your clap reactions. <laughs> it was an excellent presentation. Thanks for talking with us today. Uh, so next week, uh, Krista Dang and Annabelle Peck will be presenting developing a pain management guideline tool for residential aged care. So please join us next week on Tuesday, the 23rd at midday. And thank you very much for attending our seminars in aging program.